You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And before we get into the uh, real... Boy, that took me by surprise. I don't know about you. <laughs> We're having problems with some of our equipment here. We have been, and it's old. It's really old. I mean, this equipment has really been put through the mill. So, uh... Sometimes it decides to take off on its own. And uh, sometimes it decides not to do anything. <laughs> and, of course, that causes some problems. Before we get into the uh, real subject of tonight's broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, cover a few things here that I think need to be talked about. One is... Uh, you know, I've explained to you a long time ago that there are Russian teams here to supervise the disarmament of the United States military forces, in particular our strategic air command and our ballistic missiles. This appeared in the Arizona Republic Sunday, October 29, 1995, under Nation. Ceremony lays Cold War to rest. Russian-American destroy missile silo. Associated Press. Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri. It was a Russian's Cold War dream. Pavel Grachev triggered an explosive charge Saturday that destroyed a United States missile site that once housed a rocket ready to deliver a nuclear payload to his country. The first foreigner to blow up a United States missile silo is the Minister of Defense of Russia. How about that? This is one of the most memorable days of my life, he said. Not only my children, but my grandchildren will be talking about this event for many, many years to come. I think a lot of people are going to be talking about it for many, many years to come when they find out how they've been scammed. Ladies and gentlemen, lied to, deceived, manipulated, bullshitted, whatever you want to call it. It's not good for us. And this next one is kind of hard for me to do. Because this gentleman has been a contributor at times. But this time, he's just gone too far. He's supposed to be one of us. But just about regularly on clockwork, once a week, I get a letter from this gentleman berating me for things that I never did and never said. It's apparent that he's got a screw loose, and I hate to have to do this, but I am. I'm going to read this letter on the air. It says, Bill, well, your loving efforts of hate have borne fruit. Enclosed, please find a copy of a newsletter. I ceremonial burned the original. Where the concept is presented that homosexuals were responsible for the destruction of all the past great civilizations and are implicated as the most powerful force behind the new world order. Now tell me, is this the truth? Do you see what you have perpetrated? Are you proud? I thought it was not possible for such a small minority, such as the 3.8% of Jews in America, to gain control over the rest of the society. I thought that if they were to do this, then they would inevitably be regarded as smarter, and perhaps by that argument superior to the rest of society. I guess we can expect more gay bashings and lynchings in the future. Fortunately, the New World Order is further along in its presentations of the inequities 
of the fundamentalist religions than those religions are on the rebound. Grabbing on hypocritically to the tales of the freedom movement as they are and dragging it to a slow ideological halt. Now I'm not going to read his name on the air simply because he has made contributions in the past but he's gone off the deep end. He somehow is attributing to me what somebody else said about homosexuals and ladies and gentlemen you've never heard me say anything in my life against homosexuals except that I don't want them to try to put their homosexuality over on me or my children. That's all. I believe in liberty. I don't care what homosexuals do in the privacy of their bedroom together with consenting adults. That doesn't bother me at all. If they're doing it with children, that would bother me. But so would a heterosexual doing something with children bother me. You understand what I'm saying? But every week, this guy writes me a letter attributing to me something that I never said and never did. He is a member of the Intelligence Service in Kaji, and as of this moment, his membership is terminated. Because I think he's got a screw loose, and we can't have people with screw loose running around in our organization. I thank him for the contributions that he has made, but in the future, he'll have to make his contributions elsewhere. I don't care what his personal beliefs are. I never have. But I do care when somebody demonstrates a lack of intelligence and when they pretend to be on our side and can't even understand what it is that we're saying. So, please, sir, take your ravings elsewhere. I don't want to deal with them anymore. I have conveniently ignored them in the interest of liberty and giving you your opportunity to be whoever the world you want to be. But when you make that kind of attack upon me, when I've never said any such thing or done any such thing and don't ever contemplate doing any such thing, and if I were to read all of your letters on the air, I've got to tell you, somebody would be at your doorstep with a straight jacket tomorrow morning if I were to give them your name and address, which I won't, so don't worry about it. Folks, this is going to be an interesting trip into the mind of the mysteries, so stay tuned. And uh, <laughs> make sure you've got pen and paper handy as we continue with our excursion into the conflict between Freemasonry and Christianity. Tonight's subject, ladies and gentlemen, is the Philosopher's Stone, what it is and how it is made. Those who have studied the writings of the ancient alchemists have always been much mystified by what is said concerning the Philosopher's Stone and the process of transmuting the base metals into gold. These claims have naturally given rise to a great deal of vague speculation. From time to time, Students have asked for a direct statement concerning the subject of paramount importance and as we are standing upon the threshold of a new age where this precious jewel with all of its power will be evolved and possessed by a considerable number of people, we feel that it is important to divest the subject of all the mystery that surrounds it and speak in plain terms concerning the matter. Then. All who really wish to take the trouble involved for it involves arduous labor, nothing worth having ever gained without cost, may know how to make for themselves this great gem. We are taught that in the beginning God created heaven and earth, the whole universe in fact, and we understand that this great creative force expresses itself either as will or imagination. Now by imagination, the great architect of the universe must first have visualized 
everything as it now is, or as it was first created, and then, by his will, the physical atoms were marshaled into this matrix of thought, thus gradually bringing the universe into manifestation as designed by its creator. Nor is this process complete, but will continue until the whole has become perfect as originally designed. The divine hierarchies who have carried out the plan of the great creator also use the same dual creative force when fashioning the crystal in the mineral, the leaf of the plant, or the shape of the animal. Their powerful imagination pictures in the archetypal region of the earth that which they desire to create, and their concentrated will molds the coarser matter into this matrix until it assumes a definite physical form as desired. Man, the spirit, has a like creative power and has through ages, under the guidance of the gods, plural, learned to build bodies of increasing value as instruments for his expression. But his pilgrimage through matter was undertaken for the purpose of making him an independent creative intelligence, and to attain that end, it was necessary that he should, at the proper time, be emancipated from the guardianship of the gods, so that he might learn to create, not only for himself, but also to aid and to teach others in the great school of life. During the course of his evolution, man has become more and more enlightened concerning the mystery of life, but nevertheless, it is only a few hundred years ago when life and liberty were endangered by the expression of opinions in advance of the commonly accepted views. It was for this reason that the alchemists, who had studied more deeply than the majority, were forced to embody their teachings in highly allegorical and symbolical language. Their teaching concerning the spiritual evolution of man and their use of the terms salt, sulfur, mercury, and azoth, so mystifying to the masses, were nevertheless rooted in cosmic truths, highly illuminating to the initiate. The students of the Rosicrucian teachings who have learned how the world came into being and the process of gradual creation should have no difficulty in properly understanding every part of the alchemist's language. We know in the first place that there was a time when man in the making was a hermaphrodite, male-female, and able to create from himself. And we remember also that at that time he was like the plant in other respects. His consciousness was like that which we possess in dreamless sleep and which is possessed by the plant. The vital energy which he absorbed into his body was used solely for the purpose of growing until the time of propagation came, when a new building, or I should say, when a new budding body was cast off to grow also. There was no incentive to action, but if there had been, man would have had no mind or will to direct it. For the emancipation of humanity from this negative condition, one half of the creative force was turned upward under the direction of the angels for the purpose of building a larynx and a brain that man might learn to create by thought as do the divine hierarchies, and express the creative thought in words. Thus man ceased to be a physically hermaphrodite and became unisexual. He could no longer create from himself physically, as do the hermaphrodite plants, nor psychically, as do the Elohim, the male-female hierarchs in whose image he was originally made, and thus he occupies at the present time an unenviable intermediate position between the plant and the God. At the time when one half of the human sex force was diverted for the purpose of building the brain, 
men were helpless and lacking in knowledge of how to overcome conditions. They didn't even have the consciousness to know that there was a difficulty, and had no outside help been given the race must have died out. Therefore the angels from the moon, who were the guardians of mankind, herded the sexes together in great temples at times when the interplanetary lines of force were propitious to propagation, and thus they perpetuated the race. It was also proposed that when the brain had been completed, the lords of Mercury, elder brothers of our present humanity, who excelled in intelligence, should teach us how to use the mind and to make it truly creative, so that we would no longer be dependent upon the separate sexual process of generation now in vogue. Thus by the work of these two great hierarchies, we were raised from unconsciousness to the first stage of creative intelligence, from plant to God. Now for those of you who may have just tuned in, ladies and gentlemen, I want to assure you that these are not my beliefs. In fact, I've studied the mysteries and studied this secret religion for many, many years, and I can tell you it's absolute, complete, and utter bullshit. It's a con job used to convince those idiot followers who join these organizations knowing nothing about them so that they can slowly be indoctrinated into the new religion of the new world order which is supposedly coming if we're unable to stop it in the new age of Aquarius which will create literally a new heaven and a new earth and usher in the reign of totalitarian socialist world government upon this earth. It will take the form of a religious and political charismatic leader who is said to be ready to unite the world as one in peace forever in one world government one world religion and a new sixth root race in their literature and in their explanations and their esoteric teachings which you must understand the symbology of in order to be able to understand the meaning this means the dissolution of all nation states the destruction of all individual national sovereignty the elimination of nationalism and patriotism in fact these ideals or ideas will be called a psychotic mental illness people who believe in that way according to those who are bringing about this new world will be exterminated it means the elimination the destruction of all all of the world's religions are the combining of those religions into one which will be the secular humanist religion the propundity if you will I don't even know if that's a word but it sounds good that man himself is God you see they believe in the Luciferian philosophy and they believe it as a metaphor those of you who are teaching that these people believe that there is a devil and they worship this devil you don't know what you're talking about. These people don't believe in the God. They don't believe in the devil. They don't believe in Jehovah. They don't believe in Satan. They don't believe in any of that stuff. These tales to them are metaphors which explain the evolution of man through the use of his intellect to the position where man himself is God. And it goes something like this. Man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God named Yahweh or Jehovah. And by the way, there are many other names for that God in their religion. And God told man not to eat of the free fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or he would surely die. 
Lucifer sent his agent Satan, and many people believe that the two are the same. And I believe that also in the symbology of the religious mysteries. And Satan told Eve that God had lied to her. That if she ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she would not surely die, but would become as God. And that man was being held back from his true destiny by this jealous, vindictive God who had enslaved man in the Garden of Eden. So the apple, which represents the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is really representative of the gift of intellect, which in the mysteries is what they believe Satan, our Prometheus, <laughs> who brought man the gift of fire, really gave to mankind. And through the use of that intellect, man himself will evolve until he himself becomes God. And they believe that this gift was in particular given to the white races or race, I should say. And that part of the duty of the white race is to help the inferior races or the darker races in their evolution. Which means, if need be, get rid of some of those races if they're incapable of evolution. And in particular in their writings, it is the black and Hispanic races which they call the useless eaters. They have a particular hatred for Orthodox Jews, the followers of the Prophet Muhammad, and fundamentalist Christians. Doesn't matter what you call yourself, doesn't matter what denomination, doesn't matter what doc dogma you believe in. All scheduled for elimination. I guarantee you the world is going to change, ladies and gentlemen. Those who do not participate in the changing of it will be the inheritors of whatever the changers bring about for them. So it makes no difference whether you believe in what you are hearing tonight which, by the way, is being read verbatim from a book written by the highest priests of the mysteries, revealing the truths that are hidden behind the veil of the lodge without windows. And it was meant for those who are the initiates only and of the highest degrees. Those in the lower levels are incapable of understanding this, just as new listeners tuning in tonight haven't got the slightest idea what we're talking about. The book is called Freemasonry and Catholicism. It is about the war between the sons of Cain and the sons of Seth. the philosophers of fire, and those of the waters of faith. You can laugh at it if you want. If you're an atheist, you can say it means nothing if you wish. If you're a Christian, you can turn off your radio and refuse to hear it. If you are one of the philosophers of fire, you can become angry because your secrets are being revealed on the radio. But let me tell you this. Do not discount its power or its meaning. For those who are bringing about the new world order, the new heaven and the new earth, believe it. They are in power. They are in control. And if they believe it, it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not, whether you think it's funny or serious. It will affect you. 
happen. That is the most important thing. You cannot venture upon a field of battle if you know nothing about your enemy, about his culture, about his beliefs, about his religions, about his battle tactics, about the weapons that the enemy uses. You see, these people fully intend to enslave the human population of the earth and keep them chained to a computer in an economic system of cashless debt forever with total control of all sources of information and the elimination of anyone who dares to speak a philosophy that is not accepted by this new philosophy, which by the way isn't new at all, it's ancient. You can trace it all the way back to Babylon. So, let me continue with this after a very, I hope, short break, ladies and gentlemen. And I really hope that you're able to hear this well on shortwave. And if you're not, I hope you order the tape. You can order any tape of the hour of the time. If you're a member, they're $8 per tape. If you're not a member, they are $10 per tape. Make check or money order payable to Annie, A-N-N-I-E. Make sure that you specify the date of the broadcast and the subject as near as you can determine what the subject is. And address your envelope to the Intelligence Service, Post Office Box 1420, Sholo, Arizona, 85901. That's P.O. Box 1420. Sholo, spelled exactly as it sounds, Arizona, 85901. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. We're brought to you on WWCR Worldwide Shortwave Radio, 5.065 megahertz, and on Galaxy 6, which on most of your satellite receivers will be satellite G2, transponder 14, 7.56 audio. You would not be listening to this broadcast were it not for Craig Smith and Swiss America Trading. Craig is a deeply religious Christian man who has been aware that something is deeply, deeply wrong with this country for many years. He has faithfully supported and sponsored Patriot broadcasts over the last at least five years that I'm aware of. Craig has gambled that his firm would be able to help those in need of a real commodity that will not disintegrate over a period of time and that will not lose its value no matter what happens to the economy. By sponsoring broadcasts such as this he has pigeonholed himself and lost an awful lot of business. He has been attacked viciously by the newspapers for sponsoring this broadcast in particular and also other patriot and religious broadcast programs. One of the things that I have noticed over the years in dealing with, quote, patriots, end quote, 
is that there seems to be something lacking in their process of logical thinking. And they can't understand why they lose an awful lot of these battles. If you look at what the socialist and the liberal political establishment does in order to further their causes, it is no longer a mystery. Because they back their causes with lots of money and lots of work and lots of volunteering of their own time. Patriots, on the other hand, very seldom volunteer anything unless there's a buck in it for them. Very seldom back their own causes and would rather look around to find the cheapest deal and buy it from their enemies rather than support someone who supports programs like this who bring them information that they could not ever hope to dig out in their lifetime by themselves. Now that's a paradox because I can tell you right now you cannot hope to win if you practice that kind of behavior yet just about all of these people that I converse with tell me that they expect to win mainly because quote the good book tells them what the outcome is going to be end quote and I'm telling you right now that kind of thinking will get you buried and will ensure that you lose the battle I don't care what you believe that's the truth now I'm going to give you a phone number and I'm going to tell you right now, if you appreciate the information that is brought to you by this broadcast in particular and the others that are sponsored by Swiss America Trading, you had better support Swiss America Trading, which means if you're in the market for gold and silver or platinum or any precious metal in any of its various forms, for whatever reason you want these precious metals, where it's, whether it's to protect your assets, which is I, what I recommend, real money for, and it is real money, it is the only real money, or whether you're investing to make a profit, I don't care. If you care about this country and you care about liberty and you care about this broadcast, you had better care about doing business with Swiss America Trading. I got a letter the other day from a guy who said he appreciates my program, really enjoys the information. He's a patriot, loves this country, and loves liberty, but when it comes to buying precious metals, he's going to go to the cheapest source. He doesn't care who's selling it, and he doesn't care what I think about it, and he's tired of telling me that he's doing wrong when he does that. Well, that's tough, because I'm never going to stop telling you that you're doing wrong when you do that especially if you're buying it from the enemy. <laughs> that really makes a lot of sense, bud. you got some big brain power there, and I'm just so proud of you. Call Swiss America Trading, 1-800-289-2646 or 1-800-BUY-COIN. There's about a million reasons why you should, other than what I just gave you. And if you listen to this program regularly, or have been regularly, then you know what those reasons are. If you haven't, and you keep listening regularly, you will soon find out. Ladies and gentlemen, there has to be a time in your life when you understand what the stakes are involved in this battle. And once you discover that, you have to get serious and step out on this battlefield with those of us who are fighting this battle, actively taking the shots for the rest of you who, for the most part, sit on your couch and cheer us on, or maybe not even that much. 1-800-289-2646. Time is running out. The timetable calls for a new world with the new millennium. And if you can count, that means you got five years, bozo. 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. You'll be glad you did.
And while you're sitting there thinking about it, look around the room at the faces of your loved ones. And if you're one of those loved ones, ask the head of your household if they have taken the necessary steps to preserve what you have taken so many years to earn. And if the answer is no, then they must make this call. If they don't make the call, they don't love you. And that's the truth. 1-800-289-2646. Thus, by the work of these two great hierarchies, we were raised from unconsciousness to the first stage of creative intelligence, from plant to God. Now, if that doesn't give the whole thing away, I don't know what will. And they go on, We have also learned that this plan was frustrated by the Lucifer spirits, stragglers from the humanity of the moon period, who live upon the planet Mars. <laughs> They needed a physical field of action, but were unable to create one for themselves. Hence, for selfish reasons, they taught humanity how, by cooperation of the sexes, a new body may be created at any time. And in order to give an incentive, they instilled into mankind the animalistic, passionate nature which we now possess. Thus, to the ancient alchemists, the angels from the moon, which rules the saline tides of the sea, were designated by the term salt. They had found that a certain amount of salt in the blood is necessary to the mental processes, also that excess of salt in the blood produces insanity, as best proven by the experiences of shipwrecked sailors who became lunatics when they drink water containing the lunar element salt. Thus also they established a connection between the moon and mind. The fiery Lucifer spirits, who have taken such a baneful part in man's evolution, became associated with the fiery element sulfur. The alchemists said that man is rendered unconscious and dies by continuous inhalation of this element. So man, the spirit, was rendered unconscious of and dead to the spiritual realms by the teachings which were instilled into him by the Lucifer spirits. These are the spirits of the material world. The metal mercury, they contended, is the most elusive of all metals. It will penetrate and evaporate through most substances with which it is brought in contact, and therefore they likened it to the lords of Mercury, who are past masters in penetrating the secrets of nature by the mind. Mercury is also capable of freeing the spirit from its physical prison house. By the process of generation, carried on at a propitious time under the guidance of the angels, man was treading the path from plant to God, following the highway of evolution as originally planned. They call this God's plan. From this path he strayed into the byway of degeneration led by the Lucifer spirits and is therefore now as it were in a slough from which he cannot extricate himself save with the help of others further advanced than he. Now for those of you who may have just turned in tonight or tuned in tonight I should say this is I don't know probably broadcast number four or five in this series. You can order the other tapes. And uh, if you'd like a tape list, send one dollar. Specify that you would like to have an information package. Send it with a self-addressed stamped number 10 size envelope to the Intelligence Service, Post Office Box 1420, Sholo, Arizona, 85901. At the end of this broadcast, this address will be repeated. From this path, he strayed into the byway of degeneration led by the Lucifer spirits and is therefore now, as it were, in a slough from which he cannot extricate himself, save with the help of others, further advanced than he. When this becomes apparent to him and he starts to search for light, he stands at the pathway of regeneration guarded by the lords of Mercury 
who with their wisdom will guide him toward the desired goal. The method as outlined by the ancient alchemists we shall discuss when we have summed up in a few words the points made. These must be firmly fixed in mind to appreciate the full value of what follows. The creative force used by God to bring a solar system into manifestation and the force used by the divine hierarchies to form the physical vehicle of the lower kingdoms over which they rule as group spirits expresses itself in a dual manner as will and imagination and is the same as the united creative force of the male and the female which results in the creation of a human body. At one time man was bisexual, male, female and therefore each was able to propagate his species without assistance from anyone else. But one half of the creative force has been temporarily diverted upwards to build a brain and larynx in order to enable him sometime to create by his own mind to form thoughts and speak the word of power that shall make his thoughts flesh. Three great creative hierarchies were particularly concerned in bringing about this change the angels from the moon, the Mercurians, and the Lucifer spirits from Mars. The alchemists connected the angels from the moon, which rules the saline tides with the element salt, the Lucifer spirits from Mars with the element sulfur, and the Mercurians with the metal mercury. They used the symbolic presentation partly because of the religious intolerance which made it unsafe to promulgate any other teaching than that sanctioned by the Orthodox Church of that day, and partly because humanity as a whole was not yet ready to accept the truths which were embodied in their philosophy. And that's the biggest bunch of baloney you'll ever hear. They have intentionally withheld the truth of their religion, the truth of their philosophy, the truth of the great body of knowledge which they have collected and hoarded and concealed from the public over the ages in order to be able to control what they call the masses. They also spoke of a fourth element, Azoth, a name composed of the first and last letters of our classical languages and intended to convey the same idea as Alpha and Omega that of all-inclusiveness. This referred to what we now know as the spiritual ray of Neptune, which is the octave of Mercury, and which is the sublimated essence of spiritual power. The alchemists knew that the moral and physical nature of man had become gross and coarse on account of the passions inculcated by the Lucifer spirits, and that therefore a process of distillation and refinement was necessary to eliminate these characteristics and elevate man to the sublime heights where the splendor of the spirit is no longer obscured by the coarse coating which now hides it from view. They therefore regarded the body as a laboratory and spoke of the spiritual processes in chemical terms. They noted that these processes have their inception and their particular field of activity in the spinal cord that forms the link between the two creative organs, the brain, which is the field of operation for the intellectual Mercurians, and the genitals, which are the vantage ground for the sensuous and passionate Lucifer spirits. Now this is the truth of alchemy, ladies and gentlemen. Not too long ago, on the Tom Valentine show, Radio Free America, he had a man on there who was trying to tell you that he had actually discovered the secret of the alchemists and could turn lead into gold. He was lying, and Tom Valentine knew it. And it's one of the ways that you're kept spinning around in little circles, little eddies beside the river while the mainstream passes you by. The truth is alchemy had nothing to do with lead or gold or silver or iron or any of those things or even chemistry. It was a hidden and esoteric and occult language which hid the true belief, philosophy, religion if you will, 
of those who call themselves the philosophers of fire. Those who burn their enemies like they burned the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas and the Move Group in Philadelphia and tried to burn the Weaver family. This tripartite spinal cord was to the alchemists the crucible of consciousness. They knew that in the sympathetic section of the cord which governs the functions that have to do particularly with the upkeep and welfare of the body, the lunar angels were specially active and this segment was therefore designated as the element salt. The segment governing the motor nerves which expend the dynamic energy stored in the body by our food <clears throat> they saw clearly to be under the dominance of the martial Lucifer spirits and they therefore named that segment sulfur. The remaining segment which marks and registers the sensations carried by the nerves was named mercury because it was said to be under the dominance of spiritual beings from mercury. The spinal canal contrary to the ideas of anatomists is not filled with fluid but with a gas that is like steam and that it may be condensed when exposed to the outside atmosphere but may also be superheated by the vibratory activity of the spirit to such an extent that it becomes a brilliant and luminous fire the fire of purification and regeneration this is the field of action of the great spiritual hierarchy from Neptune and is designated Azoth by the alchemists. This spiritual fire is not unlike in every man nor is it as luminous in one as in another. The state thereof depends upon the spiritual advancement of the person in question. When the aspirant to the higher life had been instructed in these mysteries of symbolism and the time had come to speak to him plainly, the following teachings were communicated to him, not necessarily in these words nor in this manner, but at any rate he was given to understand and it was made clear to him that anatomically man belongs to the animals and that below that kingdom in the scale of evolution are the plants. They are pure and innocent their propagative practices are untainted by passion and their whole creative force is turned upwards toward the light where it manifests as the flower a thing of joy and beauty for all to behold the rose yet the plants are unable to do otherwise for they have no intelligence no consciousness of the outside world and no free will in action they can only create in the physical world however Above man in the scale of evolution are the gods, creators upon the spiritual and physical planes. And notice, ladies and gentlemen, they don't believe in one god, they believe in gods. They also are pure as the plants, for their whole creative force is also turned upwards and is expended in whatever manner their intelligence directs. And knowing good and evil, they are always do good by choice. Between the gods and the plant kingdom stands man, a being endowed with intelligence, creative power, and free will to use it for good or ill. At present, however, he is dominated by the passion instilled by the Lucifer spirits and sends one half of his creative force downward from the light to gratify his senses. In his innermost soul, he realizes that this is wrong, and hence he hides his creative instinct in shame and is outraged when it is dragged into the light. This condition must be altered ere spiritual progress can be made and therefore you must carefully consider the similarity between the chaste plant and the pure spiritual gods who both turn their whole creative power upwards toward the light. In the course of evolution you have risen above the plant which has creative power only in the physical world and have become like the gods possessing creative power on both the mental and physical planes of being besides intelligence and free will to direct it this 
was accomplished by the diversion of one half of your sex force upwards for building a brain and larynx, organs which are still fed and nourished by this uplifting half of the sex force. But while the gods direct their whole creative force to altruistic purposes by the power of mind, you still squander one half of your divine heritage upon desire and sense gratification. If, therefore, you would become as they, you must learn to turn your whole creative energy upward to be used under the direction of your intelligence entirely. Thus only can you become as the gods and create from yourself by the power of your mind and the great word whereby you may speak the creative fiat, remembering that physically you were once herm hermaphrodite like the plant and able to create from yourself. Look into the future now through the perspective of the past and realize that your present unisexual condition is only a temporary phase of evolution and that in the future your whole creative force must be turned upwards so that you shall become a hermaphrodite spiritually and thus able to objectify your ideas and speak the living word which shall endo them with life and make them vibrant with vital energy. This dual creative force thus expressed through the brain and larynx is the elixir vitae, which springs from the living stone of the spiritually hermaphrodite philosopher. The alchemical process of kindling and elevating it is accomplished in the spinal cord, where the salt, sulfur, mercury, and azoth are found. It is raised to incandescence by high and noble thought, by meditation upon spiritual subjects, and by altruism expressed in the daily life. The second half of the creative energy thus drawn upward through the spinal canal is a spinal spirit fire, the serpent of wisdom. Gradually it is raised higher and higher, and when it reaches the pituitary body and the pineal gland in the brain, it sets them to vibrating, opening up the spiritual worlds, and enabling man to commune with the gods. Then this fire radiates in all directions, and permeates the whole body, and its auric atmosphere, and man has become a living stone, whose luster surpasses that of the diamond or the ruby. He is then the philosopher's stone. Folks, don't be worried about the government collapsing or anything happening over the weekend or on Monday. This is a normal political process, and if the budget is not approved, some people will be laid off. A lot of political pressure will be placed upon whoever is stopping the budget from being approved, and then it will be approved, and then life will go on as always. Good night, and God bless you all. Mm-hmm. <laughs>